be here tonight from Washington, D.C., where the only politicians with convictions are in prison. <laughs> Why common ground? Now, both of us have been in uh, political combat uh, with other people and with each other for a very long time. Uh, but we got together uh, before we went on shows in green rooms and other places and began to discuss issues and concepts and found out that uh, a lot can be accomplished, not only if you don't care who gets the credit, but if you put the people's interests and the general welfare before your own political or partisan position. In other words, if you are looking after we the people before me and my own career, a lot more can get done than is getting done. About a year and a half ago, we started writing this feature for USA Today called Common Ground. And the newspaper says they have had more positive response on this feature than any other new feature they've carried in years, possibly ever, since the paper was founded in uh, 1980, I believe. We think that uh, an awful lot of politicians on both sides would like to reach common ground more often, but they have become prisoners of the political consultants and the media, which uh, prefer combat to consensus, and it's very difficult uh, to get them out of the way things are at the moment. So we're trying to show them a way to do that. Now, I'm a conservative. I haven't, uh, I'm not into the kumbaya, let's all have a group hug and, and nothing really matters. And Bob is a liberal and he'll tell you why he is in a moment. I'm, I'm right wing, he's wrong wing, but that's okay. Because we're all Americans and God bless America. But. Um, I want to tell you why I am a conservative, so you won't think that uh, I'm watering things down. But the point, the point of that, is that a, a word of some kind? Uh, the point is that you can hold your convictions and beliefs while at the same time uh, advancing a policy that benefits the most people. And I think we've moved away from that. So I'm a conservative. Why? Well, for a number of reasons. Number one, I believe that uh, people ought to be encouraged to do the right thing and to engage in self-control. I don't believe that I'm a victim. I don't believe that I should uh, turn to government as a first resource, but as a last resort. I think the prospect of an empty stomach is the greatest motivator to get up off your lazy butt and get a job. Now, I'm also compassionate enough that people who are handicapped or are less fortunate who need a hand up uh, should be given that. But I do believe that, uh, well, let me tell you this story. When I was growing up and I started out in my early days in journalism, I interviewed a lot of rich people, some of them driving around in New York and, or being driven around in New York uh, in limousines while I was making $99 as an Army private uh, with Armed Forces Radio fighting commies on Broadway and 57th Street in New York. <laughs> sure be going to Vietnam. But I never envied the rich. You know what I did? I interviewed them and asked them for uh, information about them. Tell me about your education. Tell me where you went to school. Tell me about your life principles. Tell me about what you did in order to become successful and wealthy. And now the attitude is, if you earn $2 and I earn $1, you owe me 50 cents just to make it fair. Well, that is offensive and foreign to me. I believe in small government. I wish more of my Republican friends did. I believe in I believe that if you earn the money, you ought to be able to keep most of it because you know how to spend it, including on charity, a whole lot better than the federal government does. Billions and billions of dollars are wasted on waste, fraud, and abuse and unnecessary programs every day. If you earn the money, you ought to have the primary uh, decision-making process for how to spend it, save it, invest it. I'm a conservative because I believe conservative principles best interpret and analyze what the human condition is and that incentive is better than welfare. Self-control is better than excuses. And uh, today we have, you know, people go on Dr. Phil and Oprah and cry about their condition in life. Uh, I prefer to tell people, look, this is America. To paraphrase the great Frank Sinatra song about New York, New York, if you can't make it here, you can't make it anywhere. This is a land of opportunity, not guaranteed outcome. Not everybody has the right to be rich, famous, and successful, but you all have the opportunity to try. That's the key to this country, and that's why I believe these principles are conservative. 
Now I'm going to turn you over to Bob here. He's going to give you the other point of view, which is to say the wrong one. Robert? <laughs> By the way, Dean, thanks for mentioning the Mondale campaign, all right? It's really nice of you. I, uh, the only guy who managed the largest loss in the history of American politics, and now I'm on TV as a political expert, only in America. Huh? <laughs> I did one a few others, but nobody remembers those. Um, I stood up for eight years on television defending Bill Clinton. Some days I felt like the only fire hydrant at the Westminster Dog Show. <laughs> but um, I know this topic tonight, and by the way, for you high school kids to be sitting here still, I, I, you took something that we don't know about. Right. <laughs> I mean, I played football in high school, man. I was in bed one way or another earlier in the evening than you are tonight. So I, and I also want to say at this brilliant institution of learning, I, I graduated from college with a 2.0001 on a football scholarship, and I, uh, that's because I had an affair with a French teacher and she gave me a passing grade. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, I also want you to know I had the shortest professional career in history. They said, uh, I, I played for the Philadelphia Eagles, they said four games, they said, son, you ought to look like for another line of work. First guy cuts, so I went in the Peace Corps, it's kind of a strange transition. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the topics, uh, sentences here tonight is, uh, and I'm going to get to why I'm a liberal here in a second, I, I must say that uh, uh, just one thing I got going for me being a liberal, particularly around here, I got no expectations, which is really good. Uh, the, uh, we, we usually speak in front of uh, some really conservative groups, I mean real wingnuts. Um, <laughs> And I like to take their money. I can stand up there and insult them all I want. But I make sure their check clears first. Um, in this case, I assume your check cleared, but if it doesn't, Thomas will make up the difference, um, given the fact he's a wealthy fellow. Um, you know, you ask here about expectations. What are the expectations immigration is there ever could be common ground and expectations? Let me just comment on the common ground piece of it. I, Cal and I came together to do this. We have not changed our positions. I still think he's a wingnut and very wrong. I do think as a liberal that our time is coming back. It's been a long time out in the wilderness. Uh, and we'll see come November 8th. But for those of you who are Republicans, uh, on November 8th, let me just give you my condolences now. Uh, you've had a good run. Uh, we made it 40 years, you made it 12. Um, <laughs> And that's, uh, and we both went down for different reasons. But um, the, uh, and I won't get into that. Now, I understand this is a, there are high school students here, and I'm sure they haven't heard of Foley. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have mentioned that. I'm really sorry. I do want to keep that out of this. It's about immigration, isn't it? Has he been deported yet? I'm curious. Uh, uh, oh, okay. That's right. He's one of yours, Cal. I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, uh, when you hear about expectations, uh, let me just tell you my favorite expectation story. True story. In 1960, and by the way, I, I did good work for Bobby Kennedy in 68 as a freshman in college. I, it makes me sound like I'm almost as old as Thomas, which is impossible. But uh, the, uh, my favorite expectation story is that Jack Kennedy's about wrapped up the nomination for president in 1960. There's a certain state senator in Georgia, Democrat, going around the South saying, we can't run with this guy, he's a Catholic. We run with this guy, a Catholic, he's going to kill us. We got to get, get, get him off the ballot. Well, to try to get the old guy calmed down, the Massachusetts State Democratic Party happened to be in convention that spring, so they invited the old boy up. And they get him back in the holding room and they say, now, Senator, out in that room there's a lot of Irish Catholics. Out in that room there's a lot of Italian Catholics. Out in that room there's a lot of Portuguese Catholics. He said, I know now, I'm not going to, I'm a Southern gentleman, I know you're worried about my anti Catholic feelings, I won't embarrass you. Don't expect anything like that. Sure enough, the old boy gets up in front of the podium and says, I want to say at the outset, I love Irish Catholics. I love Italian Catholics. I love Portuguese Catholics. Some damn Roman Catholics I can't stand. <laughs> uh, so whenever you get to expectations, I'll tell you that uh, uh, you, will, uh, you have to be very careful about it. I, let me just say about uh, why I'm a liberal, uh, which is probably, it sounds a little strange, uh, maybe because they've got a position for me in the Smithsonian being the last middle-aged guy who's a liberal in America. Uh, but uh, I'm a liberal because I don't agree with what Cal said about this being a country of equal opportunity. 
Now I grew up, I had big advantages. I, I grew up uh, in a trailer and I don't feel badly, it was a double wide with pink skirts. It was the best one on the block. <laughs> And I had an opportunity because my father happened to be a labor organizer and worked for civil, Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement, but I was white uh, and came from a relatively, uh, we weren't poor, poor, but we were okay. I had a chance. I just would ask you tonight, one of the reasons I'm a liberal is, does anybody believe that a little baby being born in Paramore tonight has an equal chance of making it as some kid being born in Heathrow? I don't think so. Ain't gonna happen. Somebody says to me, well, them welfare mothers, you know, they, they get, you know, they have these babies, fathers take off. That's right. And it's wrong. But it's not the baby's fault. So you ask me why I'm a liberal? It's for that baby. That baby, if, they're, if the parents can't take care of that baby, who's gonna feed, clothe, house, give medical care, and educate that child. Who's going to pay for that? You are, and I am, and Cal is. Because that's a responsibility we have as citizens of a country. What are we going to do? We're going to throw them out on the street? What are we going to do about immigration? What are we going to do about a kid who's uh, born in this country to illegal aliens? They were wrong to come here. They broke the law. There's no question about it. But that child's an American citizen. That's what our Constitution says. So what are we going to do? We're going to send his mother home? We're going to send his father home? 11 million illegal immigrants in this country. Even Thomas doesn't have enough frequent flyer miles to get them all home. <laughs> the insanity of all this is that we're talking about immigration policy in an election year. Who are we kidding? It's a myth. Now, I know you've heard some smart people today and there's a lot of issues and a lot of big things going on you know and smart PhDs you know I got a PhD once from a school because I gave a graduation speech the closest I ever came um, to getting one but I and I actually uh, and see you gotta understand the difference between liberals and liberals you know liberals are people like at Harvard who come up with big policy statements you know liberal theories on liberal policies well I happen to be uh, a jobs blue collar liberal. I believe in uh, work and the opportunity to have decent jobs. And I'm a liberal today because in the last seven years in this country, seven years ago, the average income in this country for a family of four was $48,200. Now after we've had uh, six years of George Bush, uh, we have had now, a, average income now is now down $2,000. But it's good news, real good news. For wealthy people in America who make $250,000 or better, their average income went up 68,000 bucks. Now that's very exciting. I'm really happy for you, but for now. Uh, I don't, I think that if you have, and, and, and the other thing I say about liberals is that liberals always think about, you know, and I can understand why you get upset with liberals, you know, because they're always gonna excuse people for everything and do this. My father, was a, as I said, a jobs liberal. He called me up, I was doing Crossfire one night on the Spotted Owl. My father calls me up after the show, he says, what's this Spotted Owl thing, Dad? I, I, Bob, I said, well, Pop, it's an you know, endangered species, it needs to go to old growth forest. He said, well, why don't we go to new growth forest? It's probably more food. I said, no, it doesn't work that way. He said, well, how many jobs? I said, about 35,000 lumber. 35,000 jobs in an owl? He said, give me my gun, I can handle that. Uh, so, you know, we're all not exactly alike. There are liberals and there's liberals uh, there are progressive people who have, some of them, conservative ideas about certain things. But I am a liberal because uh, when people say, liberals say particularly, it is us versus the powerful, I don't believe that. I do not believe in class warfare, I never have. And I'll tell you why. Because middle class Americans do not want to be lumped in with poor Americans against rich Americans. Why? Because they'd like to be rich too. And you know, there's another little secret. Most poor people would like to be rich too. There's one difference though. They're more than willing to play by the rules and work hard as long as the playing field has the same rules. Now I played football, every place I went was the same rules. We all had an equal chance. I got to be an All-American because I was pretty good at it, but I had to play by the same rules as everybody else. The difference is that wealthy people in this country do not play by the same rules. 
Middle class Americans have to do things a little differently to get there. Not to mention poor people. That's why I'm a liberal. I'm a liberal uh, to wrap this up because I don't think that uh, we ought to decide on the basis of somebody's view of what intelligence is or is not. It turns out to be intelligence that was no good. And I'm not blaming George Bush. I do not believe George Bush took us to war uh, by, because he lied. I don't think he did lie. I think some people's administration did. But I'm a liberal because I think that uh, we ought to get done with this thing in Iraq. We can't pull out, but we ought to get done with it so we can get back to the war on terror and out of a civil war where we don't belong. But uh, that's just coming. That's, I noticed, I noticed that, that among conservatives in the size, I can always tell, you know? They're looking like their heads go down a little bit farther. You know, they're down just a little bit farther. I want to wrap this up by just saying that uh, as a, in a political year, uh, you've got to be careful what you're asking for. And those of you who are Republicans are asking the Republicans to maintain the majority in the House and the Senate. Now, they may. Who knows? I don't think so, but they may. Uh, but you better know that when you have both the House and the Senate and the White House and things go wrong, you can't blame us for it anymore. You try to. You try your best. Rush gets on and Sean Hannity gets on, who's an old friend of mine. Oh, you wave the bloody white flag of surrender and you just want to run and cut and run and the same stuff. Or it's a liberal conspiracy. We're the reasons that the name I'm not supposed to mention tonight, Congressman from Florida, uh, got caught up in that. It was a Democratic conspiracy. I wish we were that smart. We are not. <laughs> this is a wholly owned now subsidiary of the Republican Party. If you like it and you think things are going well, vote for them. If you don't, then you won't. My guess is a few more won't than will. Uh, but there was, uh, I'll end this with a story about two brothers who get killed in a car wreck. There's the older, serious brother, Cal. This is about making sure you know what you want in life. And the younger, frisky brother, Bob, they killed in the car wreck to go to the pearly gates and see St. Peter. He said, St. Peter, we shouldn't be dead. We're too young. St. Peter said, boys, I'm having a bad day, too, so I'll tell you what. You can go back down to earth, but you can't be human because you're dead. So what do you want to be? So they asked the serious brother, Cal, and Cal said, I'd like to be an eagle. Okay, fine, you'll be an eagle. They asked the younger, friskier brother, Bob, and Bob said, I'd like to be a stud. Okay, fine. Eagle. Six months go by, of course, they don't come back. And so he calls the angel Gabriel and says, Gabe, we're going to find those two brothers. His old brother, Cal, he's not going to be hard to find. He's an eagle somewhere over the Golden Gate Bridge of the Grand Canyon. The younger brother, Bob's going to be a little bit more difficult because he's a two-by-four in a condominium someplace in New Mexico. <laughs> So I uh, am constantly reminded of that when I'm uh, saying, what do you want to be uh, and what are you looking forward to? Uh, be careful knowing what you ask for and also know that in a political year, there is nothing that's certain. There's a lot of time between now and the election day, so all of you Republicans do not need to grieve quite yet. All right, thank you. You always know that uh, we live in interesting times when, uh, uh, when a Democrat brings up uh, the lack of virtue of a member of Congress. I love that. We want to give you an example. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> well, that was a spotted owl going overhead. Uh -huh. <laughs> we want to give you an example of uh, how we hash out an issue, starting from uh, the various perspectives we hold, with the objective of actually finding common ground that will benefit the most people uh, at the end. So we're going to quote from a column we did in April on this very subject of immigration. And we'll start uh, down in a little bit, uh, away from the dated opening when Congress returned after Easter, because that is no longer relevant. It crystallizes a serious legal and cultural problem. People are losing respect for the law, and we are losing our sense of who we are as a nation. The United States is quickly being transformed from our national motto, out of many, one, to out of one, many. And people are rightly concerned. This is a nation of immigrants. The difference is that most of the current illegal immigrants are from Mexico, and the majority don't speak English. In 1996, excuse me, 1986, President Ronald Reagan signed a law granting amnesty to more than two million illegal immigrants. Now, I know, just to break the text, the amnesty, the Republicans poll tested that one, and that was what drove everybody away. Use the word amnesty, boys, on the, on the trail when you campaign. Amnesty deals. Okay. The last politician who used it was Ronald Reagan. Um, and uh, two, million, two million illegal immigrants were allowed in this country. There were tough penalties. 
for future illegal immigrants and the people who, who hired them. Those uh, sanctions have been blatantly ignored by administrations of both parties and particularly ignored by the business community, which uses illegals as a source of cheap labor. Sidelight exit, it's about time. I would like to see a perp walk of people who hire illegal immigrants before I see a perp walk of illegal immigrants. I spoke recently with the co-author of that 1986 uh, bill, former Republican Senator Alan Simpson of Wyoming. He told me that though the measure admitted nearly three million aliens from 92 countries, Congress intended it to be the last amnesty. Simpson said it would have worked, but Congress would not create a secure identifier, such as a biometric card or retina scan, because some conservative Christians regarded government's use of technology to number us as a precursor to the mark of the beast in Revelation. Simpson said that's why we have 12 million more now, and that unless a secure identifier is created, along with better border policing, more aliens will follow. This is where I depart from my liberal friends who oppose uh, that kind of identification. I agree with Simpson, Cal. He, he always was a thoughtful Republican. If there ever was an oxymoron, there it is. Uh, the, thrust, uh, the thrust of the bill in the House of Representatives, though, uh, that's the one controlled by the wingnuts, um, is uh, to make the uh, mere presence of illegals a felony then we're to find uh, the 12 million and send them home. It's not only ridiculous, it's undoable. True, but at least there's a law and order concern in that proposal. Senate Democratic Majority, Minority Leader uh, Harry Reid, on the other hand, today suggests that illegal aliens don't pose much of a criminal threat at all and should be simply ushered in. This is the same man who in 1993 introduced a bill to drastically scale down the number of immigrants allowed. He said at the time, quote, our borders have overflowed with illegal immigrants, placing tremendous burdens on our criminal justice system, schools, and social programs. Our federal wallet is stretched to the limit by illegal aliens getting welfare, food stamps, medical, medical care, and other benefits without paying any taxes, unquote. Reid takes a more liberal stance today because he thinks it will pay off politically for Democrats. Uh, yeah. Uh, and you don't think House Republicans are playing politics with the right-wing pandering bill they came up with? Uh, let's get down to the basics. Uh, all right, how do you find 12 million people, and what do you do with them when you find them? The nonpartisan Pew Hispanic Center estimates more than 7 million of them are working. We can assume most of the rest are spouses and children, many of whom are born in the United States and are therefore citizens. Let's call the 7 million what they are a cheap labor pool for employers who don't want to pay benefits, and in some cases, the minimum wage. Well, we hear a lot about immigrants doing jobs Americans don't want to do. Maybe more Americans would do them if employers weren't allowed to pay immigrants less in pay and benefits than they are required to pay American citizens. I fear that a new underclass might be created if a two-tier pay and benefit system is permanently established. With no education and with little hope for advancement, these immigrants, even if their status was made legal, face a future of manual labor and potential poverty that will cost this country more than money. Yeah, sure, because cheap labor means large profits to corporate America. One of the proposals that stalled actually uh, makes sense. It calls for all illegals who have been here for two years or more to register for a tamper-proof ID card. Without the cards, they would not be allowed, for example, to obtain driver's license. Employ employers who hire illegals without the ID card, ID card uh, would be subject to serious fines. I will now add, I think they should be jailed. Uh, with the cards, illegals would be guaranteed at least the minimum wage and standard employee benefits. They would also pay taxes on what they earned illegally, in addition to a $2,000 fine, after which they could apply for a permanent legal residency in a parens, that is the proposal by the President of the United States, George well, that's fine. W. Bush. Thank you for those who didn't know his name. That's fine, Bob, but I, I don't want anything uh, approaching amnesty or forgiveness for violating our laws until we effectively shut the border. Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist and House Speaker Dennis Hastert indicated 
uh, over the last uh, break in, in the spring that they do in fact want a comprehensive approach, meaning we may actually get legislation that can address border security and the illegals already here. Otherwise, more will come before we can process those already here, a proposition that polls show the public won't buy. And they shouldn't buy it. We've had a, enough immigration band-aids over the past few decades. But let's remember this when we get to our discussion here about how comprehensive these boys wanted to say we're going off the campaign. Well, that's a fact, Bob, and the dirty little secret in all of this is the incestuous relationship between businesses that benefit from cheap labor and politicians who benefit from campaign and political action committee contributions. Equal pay and benefits for equal work would reduce the incentive to hire illegals, and then it would either reduce the motivation of the illegals to come here, or if they did come, they would be paid something that does not approach slave labor. Cal, you sound positively liberal, my man. But look, illegal immigration won't cease with that alone. So I agree with the proposal for a 700-mile long barrier across the U.S.-Mexican border. It discourages people from coming to work for slave wages, as you suggest. And my most important reason for that 700-mile fence is not to get political votes, but it will prevent a lot of those people crossing who die in the desert from dying, including little children. Well, Bob, you sound positively conservative, but you're right, or in this case left, no nation can survive if it doesn't control its borders. Besides, we know that in addition to the people who slap up drywall, an unknown number of criminals, including some who might be terrorists, are itching to get in. These are the ones who we need to stop to preserve our way of life, our culture, and our individual lives. Uh, and my guess is criminals and terrorists won't be applying for ID cards, uh, which should uh, make them easier to find, frankly. The bigger problem is the illegal population that has been here fewer than two years. The Senate proposal calls for them to be sent home, where they'll then apply to re-enter the country legally. I don't think that's realistic, but in an, in an election year, it's probably necessary to reach a compromise. Even with that, I expect conservatives will say that by providing ID cards to illegals, we are condoning law-breaking. Well, some will, but the two are not contradictory if done in the proper order. Control the border first and then create a program that will allow those who get here illegally to get in line and follow the law towards citizenship. If the ID card guarantees them a minimum wage and benefits, and if they pay back taxes and a fine, that fine could then fund the border barrier. That's an excellent idea. One other point. Many of my fellow liberals believe strongly in bilingual education. That's a formula for segregation. There should be as rapid a transformation from Spanish to English as possible. Conservatives see the requirement that immigrants learn our language as punitive. I see it in the best long-term interest of immigrants and their children. And your rap was? See si, me amigo. Yeah, very good. Thank you. It was your idea, I think. We seem to have found a good bit of common ground on this issue. I think California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, an immigrant himself, a legal one, summed things up nicely in a column recently in the Los Angeles Times. Here's what he said. We can embrace the immigrant without endorsing illegal immigration. Granting citizenship to people who are here illegally is not just amnesty, it's anarchy. We are a country of immigrants, yes, but we are also a nation of laws. People who want to be citizens will want to do it the right way, unquote. I would only add, in closing this part, that if they don't do it the right way as we determine it, we should put them on the highway back to where they came from. Okay, now, that's, that's, uh, that was the end of our Common Ground article, and if you'll see in the course of this, with the exception of that last wingnut line uh, that Cal used, uh, he always closes these things out so he can put one of these right-wing lines in there. But the point is that we came to the conclusion in this Common Ground article that we could, first you had to secure the border. We agree on that. Secondly, there had to be punitive damages assessed, and I have had a jail time for people who hire illegal immigrants knowingly, that there needs to be some process of getting people here in a line after paying fines and paying for back taxes, as George Bush said, and get them into the citizen pool. Those that are here less than two years, if you can get them back home, more power to you, but that should probably happen. 
we did say in here about the 700 mile fence when uh, Frist and uh, Hastrick said, oh, we want a comprehensive proposal. We just don't want a fence. And I think I remember saying uh, as we were writing this, Cal, you watch. This gets close to election day. There'll be a 700 mile fence and nothing comprehensive about it. After that, what did they do? The Republicans all got scared, and they all went running around. They all went home. They heard from, all, they heard from the Minutemen, you know, those older people on the border with Sean Hannity who can't get a tea time. Uh, and so they go down with their, their trailers and their, uh, uh, their binoculars, and they spy. So, ooh, there's one. Um, now, uh, they, uh, and, you know, they, it, I had it out with one of them. Uh, the, she hit me, this old lady with a bag. Uh, but uh, the fact is that they did pass this thing at the 11th hour, so they go home and say, we got tough on immigration. What do you think that's going to do? It's going to do absolutely nothing. A, they don't have any money to pay for it. B, I don't care how big a fence you build, people are going to figure out how to get under it, around it, or over it. And there's got to be a comprehensive standard here, and I think both Cal and I reached a conclusion about that. And I think we both gave a little bit. I agree, Cal agreed on minimum wage, being paid minimum wage which I applaud him for. Most of his wingnut friends uh, think that minimum wage means that McDonald's will stop if you increase it. Every time they've increased minimum wage, there hasn't been a single business gone out of work in this country, not one. Uh, and I agree, as much as I don't like the idea, but I think that the idea of having uh, photo IDs or IDs that are, are tamper-proof are a good way of assuring that you don't go out on the market and get yourself illegal uh, identification. I can go out here. I don't even know this area. I can go out here. I'll bet you in 45 minutes I can go back here with a driver's license, a social security card, and four or five other things. I learned that in my five years uh, up the river in, in, in Alcatraz. But I, uh, the, uh, no, I'm only kidding. I, so there's only two. Um, <laughs> but, there, you know, you, you can get away with this all you want until you have something that really can be tamper-proof, and it has to be a part and parcel of getting a job or a driver's license or anything else. That can work, but the only way any of this is going to work is if we do it outside of the context of an election. It is too tempting for politicians to make political hay out of this whole immigration issue. They may start out with a good idea, but they don't end up there. They end up caught up in politics. Like this, who was that Italian dude from Colorado? Tranciano or whatever his name is. What's the congressman's name? Tom Tancredo. You're thinking your transvestite friends. Uh, I <laughs> See, the difference between Well, my, my transvestite friends wouldn't make idiotic comments like he did, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> he called me a wingnut five times, obviously a graduate of our public schools. When I insult, I try to have a diversity of words, but go right ahead. <laughs> oh. I'm the right side, you're the wrong side. But I, I think we did, that's, that's the way we do find common ground. We try to take an issue like this. We don't agree on everything. But in the end, we come up with some ideas that we think are, are, will work, and we look at them politically, too. I mean, we're not, we, we are not people falling out of the policy jungles here. We know politics. We've been on the ground politically. I think we could cut a deal here. I think we could get started. Uh, the 700 mile fence alone is not the way to do it, but there's way, there are ways to do it, and I think we can find a way to do it. One of the things that would probably help in this, frankly, and I don't accuse this of just being Republicans and Democrats are falling into this too, but we better be very careful that we begin to isolate and point out immigrants who happen to be of a different color. I do not notice many of the Minutemen and women standing outside of Logan Airport in Boston. When Aer Lingus comes in with 425 Irish tourists for a week on a one-week visa and leaves with three of them. Now, I don't notice a big hue and cry about that. I've asked Pat Buchanan about it, big on immigra illegal immigration. Pat, why don't we go intercept all the mix from up in, in Boston, right? Being one myself. I said, come on, we know, we speak the language, let's go, let's go find them. Ah, oh, they're not as big, they're not as many of them as there are other people trying to take over the whole country from Mexico, you know. You got, this has got to be an equal opportunity law all the way around, whatever we do. And we're going to have to try to do it together and be inclusive and not point out just Mexicans here. Um, yes, I agree with that. I want to mention costs a little bit because a lot of you young people ha will soon, when you get jobs, have a great deal invested in this subject because it costs the federal government and the state governments a considerable amount of money which has to come from somewhere and it's going to come from your paychecks 
and the increased taxes if the Democrats get back in control of government that you're going to have to pay. So this is in your personal interest. Listen to just a couple of states, beginning with Florida, and what it is currently costing at the present illegal immigration rate. This is what you can look forward to paying if we don't change your future. In Florida, illegal aliens are costing the state government, this is not the federal government, this is only one state out of 50, $1.7 billion a year after subtracting the taxes, Social Security and sometimes a few other taxes that these illegals pay, the net outlays are still almost a billion dollars a year, which amounts to $300 per Florida household. That's at current rates. Nothing stays stagnant. You can look for these rates to grow. grow. In New York State, an analysis based on current estimates of the illegal alien population residing in New York State indicates that population is costing the state's taxpayers more than $5.1 billion a year for education, medical care, and incarceration. And as you know, when someone gets sick and can't afford medical insurance or, uh, or their own doctor, they go to the emergency room of the hospital where by federal law, the doctors, the nurses have to provide care for them. Who's going to pay for that? You and I are. This is a further subsidy of illegal behavior. If you put a saucer of milk out for a stray cat, the cat is going to keep coming back. We have to put in place the kinds of policies that will encourage people to obey our laws. We want people to come and become Americans, fully Americans, embracing our history, our culture, our beliefs, and what it means to be an American. Not a hyphenated American, not an American with other agendas, not coming here to deliberately change the policy of this country toward other countries, and to in fact engage in sedition and to destroy this country as some of the extremists who come here wish to do and are planning to do, and as we saw on 9-11, have already done. These are serious issues. There is no constitutional right to come to America any more than there is a right for me to go to my second favorite country on earth. Bob mentioned Ireland. I love Ireland. I go there frequently, my wife and I. But they always stamp my passport when I go to Northern Ireland or even the Republic. Valid for six months. Plus, the stamp says I'm not allowed to hold a job in that country. They don't want me to stay as a foreigner. If they did, they'd allow me to have a job. They don't want me to have a job. Do I feel discriminated against? No, I leave and come back a few months later. It's okay. They want to maintain their Irish culture, heritage, and identity. That's fine. I don't disagree with that. Same in France, same in Germany, same in countries in South America. You can't come and reside there illegally. Not legally, anyway. Uh, you have to go home. We want people to come to America. We love that they love us and admire us and want opportunities, but we want them to come legally and to obey our laws while they're here and to embrace what it is we love about this country so we can pass along the country we inherited from our parents and grandparents to our children and grandchildren. Is that asking too much? I don't think so. Not based on race, not based on class, not based on religion, but based on a common cultural, historical heritage and belief. That's what it means to be an American. And if you can come legally and do that, we want you. We want you to become an American. If you can't, we don't want you to come at all. If you're uh, uh, talking about costs, and then we're going to do one uh, quick thing to wrap this up and take your questions, but uh, costs in hospitals for uh, Illegal, you know, illegal aliens uh, reminds me of ET. Mm -hmm. uh, if we could maybe could compromise and say immigrants, illegal immigrants, it might be a little better. Um, I have this vision of these pointy-headed things, you know, coming. Uh, but what about the 46 million Americans who don't have health care insurance, who end up in in uh, emergency rooms because the medical uh, industry in this country and the insurance industry in this country has decided that 
uh, in a collaborative effort to uh, deny uh, their profits, any of their profits towards uh, helping insure Americans when there were some good ideas for health insurance reform. And I'm talking about 46 million bona fide U.S. citizens who do not have health care and go to emergency rooms. It is a smittance when you talk about illegal immigrants compared to those in America who, in an unbelievable, disgraceful situation, do not have insurance and the one in six children go to bed in this country, legal in this country, every night in hunger and poverty. This is the United States of America, and it's a disgrace, and it shouldn't be happening. Um, and all I'll say about costs, I think it is going to cost a lot of money. We need more law enforcement. We need to have ways to really try to secure our border, our ports. Terrorism is an important part of that. Uh, I was doing handy and combs about three weeks ago, and they caught four Afghanis who had crossed over from Mexico into the United States who had been living in Mexico City for a year, um, learning English um, and uh, Spanish as well. Now, I think that you have to worry about people coming over there who are terrorists. And I would only say if we would not, we're about to approach our 300 billionth dollar in the Iraqi war. 300 billion dollars. Within another couple of months, regrettably, we will have lost more American soldiers than we lost in all of 9-11. We can't get out of there now, I recognize that. But keep that in mind, $300 billion. And every time I hear somebody who's a gung-ho supporter of that war complain to me about illegal immigrants coming in here and there's not enough money to deal with them, I've got no sympathy for them whatsoever. Any more than I had sympathy, you know, you keep, people raise Clinton all the time, you know, and, and I, at me. Oh, by the way, did you hear that Hillary was running around the mall with a big, black, ugly dog? Yes. Yeah, I did. Yeah, Bob Dole ran behind her and said, Hillary, what's with the dog? She said, I got him for Bill. Dole said, good trade. Okay. <laughs> good. We wanna, I want to talk, lastly, about patriotism. This is a subject that uh, has divided this country with one party, mostly the Republicans and the conservatives, thinking they have a patent on it, like uh, some invention they thought up and the demonization of the other party, largely the Democratic Party, uh, if they don't agree with the Republican principles, then somehow they are less patriotic and love this country less than the Republicans do. I reject that. I think that is idolatry. I also think it is absolutely flat wrong. This came home to me as it has many times, but uh, most deeply this past January when my wife and I paid uh, my, our first visit to Normandy. I've always wanted to go. My dad and his brothers were all in World War II. One of my uncles was at Omaha Beach in the second wave that came ashore on June 6, 1944. It is uh, as close to a holy place on earth that I think you can get. It is uh, somber, it is uh, peaceful, it is profound when you know the sacrifices that were made there for our freedoms. We visited the American Cemetery, beautifully kept respectful grounds with Thousands of crosses and stars of David lined up in military precision, row upon row. And as I went out on that cold January rainy day, clouds overhead and a profound chill in the air, I went in among those grave markers and looked at some of the names. Some were, were what you might expect, uh, familiar names, Smith and Brown and Jones and Green. But there were others like Alvarez and people of different ethnic and cultural backgrounds buried there. And I thought once again, as I had thought in theory before, but now was touched deeply by seeing it up close, that there were no Ds for Democrats or Rs for Republicans on those grave markers. There were no indications of their political philosophies if at the age of 18, 19, 20, and a few who were sergeants who might have lived till 30-something, there were no uh, indications of their political philosophies. Most of them who died for us that we might live in freedom and liberty in this country, in this age, uh, did not marry and had no posterity of their own. Their blood was all of the same color regardless of their religious belief, their political affiliation, or their ethnic and cultural heritage. 
It is a profound thing to see that. And I think it is a kind of blasphemy for people who are part of a nation that was born in rebellion, uh, that uh, rebelled against the British, and if you want to go back far enough, uh, rebelled against the Native Americans, or you can go back even further than that if you like, but uh, this is a nation that was born out of dissent. And to, to suggest that a disagreement over policy is somehow unpatriotic is a denial of our own history. And I think it is the ultimate anti-Americanism and the ultimate anti-patriotism. So I want to say as a conservative that I don't own the patent on patriotism. I love this country. And I believe my friend Bob does too. We both had dads who served in World War II. I was in the military. I never asked Bob if he was, but uh, it doesn't matter. We, we, we each contribute to this country in many different ways. And we all love it in different ways. Presumably we do or we wouldn't be living here. And I think dissent is a high form of patriotism. And you can love this country just as much by disagreeing with the current administration or a previous one or the next one as someone who might endorse their policy. So that's my take on that. Bob? You know, I, I've, uh, I heard, I've heard Cal talk about this as we've traveled around the country. I, I uh, despite some jazz we've given back and forth tonight, I, I've got to tell you that uh, there are times in your life, and you'll understand this, I think, and those of you who are younger, there comes a time when there was one lesson I had in my life um, from my dad, who was at Normandy himself. Um, and he used to have it a different way. He'd say that, the blood that was spilled on the beaches was not uh, Democratic blood or Republican blood or independent blood. It was American blood. But you don't ever want to burn bridges in life. I don't care whether it's politically or in business, neighbors. You know, there's nothing that can happen to you so bad that you have to turn away from another human being and say, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Or I'm going to hate you. You don't ever want to hate anybody. At a very difficult time in my life, very difficult, this gentleman sitting over here came to my help. Saved my life, really, in many ways. And he didn't come as a Republican or a conservative to help a Democrat or a liberal. He became because he was my friend. When I, in, the, in 2000, I was accused unfairly of trying to uh, changed the electoral votes in the presidential race. It was not true, but it got on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I ended up going into a safe house because they caught a guy with a rifle with a picture of me about five yards from my house with a bullet hole in it. And they said, we think you ought to maybe go to Phoenix. Bob, I said, fine, let's go. Had to get my kids and my wife and move them to a secret location. And I ended up in a safe house with two goombas from the Genovese family and a, and a rabbi. <laughs> That was kind of interesting. The rabbi wanted to pray every day, and the Goombas wanted to watch The Price is Right. And I had to try to broker that deal. Uh, and I said, Joey, how many people did you kill in your life? 21? Oh, a rabbi? What do you got to put in the pot? Anyway, I gave the rabbi my room, and they watched The Price is Right. And I said, why do you watch The Price is Right? They said, well, we ripped off enough trucks. We know what the price is of these things. <laughs> but um, the, the people that came to my aid when this started were people like John McCain, Ed Rollins, Newt Gingrich, who called me up and said, Bob, we don't believe you would do something like this. And I wouldn't have done it. Uh, and they were people who I had maintained relationships with over the years, not because I thought it would be a good idea that someday they'd be in power. I mean, there was a long time when the Republicans were out of power that I thought they'd never get into power. But the point was that these were people who were my friends, and I had a lot to learn from them and vice versa. I have been accused more times than I can tell you. I have been threatened um, uh, every day when I'm on Fox. If I don't get 38 mails a day, I'm not doing my job. But some of them are pretty nasty. Now, I get back to them, and I always say, thank you for your kind words. By the way, was it your mother who married her brother or your father who married his sister? <laughs> and of course, some idiot from Kentucky get back to me and say, you lying fat liberal. He says, my father married his cousin. Uh, <laughs> but. The hatred that is out there, that's clearly out there on both sides, and I see it coming from my side as much or if not more in some cases. There are people who are on the internet on the left that I 
find outrageous. I had a major confrontation with MoveOn.org, pointed out to them that I was out doing liberal work before they were gleaming their daddy's eyes. And uh, we never did agree, but it didn't really matter. At least we walked away not yelling at each other. What is happening now in politics is that polarization has set in. And I'll give you a, a fast statistic. 20 years ago, 35% of the members of the House of Representatives would vote with the other party on the floor of the House on, a very, on serious big, big issues. Today, in this Congress, less than 1% cross party lines. The number of people who are threatened if they cross party lines with chairmanships and with money. The money in politics has been controlled now centrally by the political parties, the Democrats and Republicans both, their congressional, House and Senate campaign committees. You think anybody can stray from the ideological line? No. Are there members of Congress who are moderates on both sides who would like to see things get done, consensus and a return to bipartisanship? You bet. But they've been intimidated and scared. And one of the reasons we've carried this message, Cal and I, around the country is we firmly believe that there are more of us who believe in getting back to the politics of consensus and bipartisanship than there are of them. They are a raging minority who are in anarchy against the majority. And you've got a responsibility. We go around and do this. We travel around. Sometimes it's not easy. But you've got a responsibility too. Because polarization and hatred starts in places not just in the US Congress. We've got to treat each other like human beings. On the war in Iraq, you obviously know I don't like it. But after this election is over, we're not going to get any discussion that's meaningful between now and four weeks from now. But after this is over, my message to my Democratic friends is, we may not have thought this was the right war to get into, but we are in it. And it is not a Republican war, and it's not a Democratic war. It's an American war. And we need an American way to get out of it. And if I were the Democratic leadership in the House and the Senate, whether they take over the majority or not, is to turn to George Bush and for once, say, look, let's sit down and see if we can figure out together how we can get this done in the, without being accusatory. If we can just go forward here and say to these polarizers, and these people make money at it. Let's remember, polarizers benefit from polarization. They want it, whether it's talk radio or left-wing bloggers, they make money at it. It's in their interest to perpetuate. They're bullies, but they're punks. In the end, they are punks. And if you ever get them together in one room, they run like scalded dogs. Speaking about dogs, most of them are missing a few from underneath their front porches. But the fact of the matter is that there are more people who want in this country, de desperate for us to get back to a civilized debate about politics. Cal Thomas and I can do it. We can make fun of one another. But I'll tell you one thing we never do, even if we don't agree. We never walk away angry or ever walk away in a position where we can't come back to the table and try to figure it out. This is a great American patriot. And I am proud to be with him, and I'm proud to be here tonight. Thank you all very much. And, um, my question has to, happens to be, we don't choose our race, we don't choose our gender, we don't choose where we're born. Do you think it's about time that we dispense with having some people um, who are not allowed to be president of the United States because, you know, the Constitution has that natural born clause. Is it about time we get rid of that? No. I want to keep it. And I think it's important. Uh, I, I also want to do away with the, uh, with the interpretation. Bob said earlier, it's not really in the Constitution, but it's been interpreted by the courts almost from the beginning that if you're uh, uh, the child of a... Of a, of a, of a uh, of an alien, uh, an immigrant, an illegal immigrant, that you get automatic uh, citizenship status. I want to do away with that too. Uh, being an American is more than just being born here, as I said earlier. Uh, I think the, uh, the reason the founders put that in the Constitution about being a native-born American was because they understood at the time, multiplied in our time, of, uh, of the potential danger of having someone from somewhere else uh, who wasn't an American to come in here and run for president and do some uh, nasty things to undermine this country. Uh, so I want to keep that and um, you know I don't want to run for president of Ireland or uh, anywhere else um, and I, I want to keep that provision. It, it, the, uh, let me uh, say we, we don't have common ground on this. I think it's a, an absurd provision and it, it reminds me a little bit about when the founders, you know, democracy is a journey. It is not an end. 
and we're still on a journey. And in the course of that journey, we have the ability to change our Constitution and have many times since the founders were involved in it. Um, I say, for example, I mean, it's not my party, but uh, I think Senator Martinez was born in Cuba, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Now, um, I have a real problem. This is not going to make a lot of you happy, I'm sure, in this room. I don't have no idea, it's still to this day, why you're allowed to become uh, automatically allowed to grow to citizenship here because you get here from Cuba, and you can't do that if you get here from another country, but I understand. I understand the lobby and, and that bad commie down there and all that. Uh, but uh, I don't understand why it is that somebody like Martinez, I mean, he's not going to sneak up on anybody. Uh, if he wanted to run for president, he ought to be able to run for president. I, I, I just, uh, I don't understand it. I really don't. I, uh, uh, you know, they decided to put a uh, two-term limit on, on uh, the president because of Roosevelt. Um, I happen to think that limits, uh, Cal and I have come to agreement on term limits. This argument that somehow that you need this experience to stay in Congress is it's the ones who are the experienced ones that are going to jail uh, because they figured out how to get the system cranked around. I've got we've come up with an idea that we think uh, that will work is is taking former members of Congress and if you get an impasse, almost have it like like a mediation court. Bring in former members of Congress who have no special interest to deal with but understand the system and ask them to mediate, and then do a yes or down up up or down vote. No more than the than the. Uh, uh, base commission. It was the same thing. The reason the base commissions ended up the way they did was nobody could bring themselves to vote against somebody. Else. You know how it is, kind of. So what do they do? They turn to a commission of people who knew what they were talking about. They up or down vote. Well, fine. If we're going to be stymied on immigration reform and we've got four or five things we can't agree on, have a have a uh, compromise. Former member of Congress caucus who aren't pressured by any side, don't need to get reelected. Let them come up with a with a uh, consensus, a mediation consensus. If you don't like it, vote it down. If you like it, vote it up. Uh, you both seem to say that it's time for a change in Congress, and I assume in the Senate as well. Personally, are you, without knowing who your representatives are, are you re-electing your current congressman, or are you uh, changing on your own personal ballot? Yeah. Well, no, I, I have, I, by the way, I voted for Democrats in the past. I, my first vote was ca uh, cast for Lyndon Johnson because he promised not to get us involved in a land war in Asia. That worked out well, didn't it? <laughs> he, so we got the Goldwater policy, but with Lyndon Johnson. So, anyway my first baptism into the reality that some politicians lie. A very formative experience in my young life. <laughs> uh, now I'm called a cynic. Um, yeah, my, my particular uh, congressman, uh, Frank Wolf of Virginia, is a good guy. I'd say he's a you know, moderately conservative Republican. He has lots of Democrat friends, travels with them, tries to reach common ground on things. I think he's a wonderful uh, individual. I'm married to the same woman all of his life, which is getting increasingly rare. and. Um, you know, when, uh, well, I won't do any page jokes. Uh, and uh, I happen to, I've known uh, George Allen, despite, you know, the recent, you know, somebody followed you around all day with a video camera. I'm sure we could find something that would be incriminating to you, too. But uh, I've known his father, the former Washington Redskins football coach. And uh, I certainly prefer him over, uh, over Jim Webb. But those personal preferences. I don't, you know, Jim Webb has served his country, veteran, uh, served in the Reagan administration briefly as Navy Secretary, and um, so I think, uh, you know, Virginia is going to be in decent shape no matter who wins that election, but I'll be voting for George Allen and Frank Wolf. Uh, the, uh, I've got to be honest with you, I never voted for a Republican in my life, and I've got to tell you why. When I was 13 years old, my father took me as a civics lesson into a voting booth in Connecticut. That's when you had levers. You pulled one lever and the entire Democratic line would fall. If you wanted to split your ticket, you had to read 13 pages in Hungarian to figure out how to do it. <laughs> so my father said, son, you see that Democratic lever? I said, yeah. He said, you pull that, all good things are going to happen to you. Women, money, cars, jobs. <laughs> and I said, well, what if I pull the Republican lever? And he said, you're going to die. <laughs> now, that left an impression on a young boy. And every time, every time I've gotten near a Republican name, I've gotten like this. I can't quite bring myself to do it. Take me with you next time. Uh, I'll help you out. I, no, I'd say that would be dangerous, <laughs> particularly in my precinct. Uh, I'll tell you what I have decided to do. I am not going to vote for my member of Congress. I have to like. He'll be up for his third term the next time around, and I, I will go into his fourth, and I will not vote on that line. Uh, I have just did a poll, uh, which will, it's just shocking to you. You want to know how, how dissatisfied Americans are? You know, they always say they hate Congress, but they love the congressman. 
We asked a question on the poll, which we've asked before. If, we, if you could, in this election, vote out every member of the House of Representatives, including your own, and every senator, including both your senators, and start over, normally we get about 47 percent on that. We had 76 percent favorable on that of a 2,000 survey, and it matched on cross tabs. So I, it'll tell you something about the disenchantment, but I won't vote for anybody running for federal office for the third, twice as a senator, three times as a House member, and we also go further than that. I think federal judges ought to be appointed for 14-year terms. They can only be extended seven more years if the president in office at that time renominates re them and the Senate uh, gives them their vote. 21 years for a judge is plenty of time to cause damage. <laughs> <laughs> or I know there's a judge here. I mean, I already do good. Don't get me wrong. These officers back here are smiling. I, know, I bet I know what they're thinking. Gentleman in the black shirt back here. Um, Mr. Bakel mentioned earlier, remarked earlier, how are we supposed to catch 12 million some odd illegal immigrants throughout mm -hmm. the country when in fact a good portion of them, not only, especially here in Orlando, rallied and assembled um, and protested some of those illegal immigrant policies that were trying to be passed in um, in Congress. Uh, my question is, why didn't we go get them then? Um, some people would say, you know, they're protected under the First Amendment of the right to assemble, but since they are illegal immigrants, they have no constitutional rights. Well, that's a, that's a good question. You don't, have to be, you don't have to be nervous about it. You can pronounce my name right. It's Beckel. It's okay. Bechtel is a, I, I don't, I wish I was a member of that yeah, family. Really. Uh, the, uh, but I'm not. Um, First of all, let me tell you, we, we also did uh, some pretty extensive survey work on those people who protested. And uh, better than half of them are legal, number one. You're right, though, there were a lot of illegals out there. My argument about that would be, uh, how would you separate them out, number one? Number two, before you did that, I would certainly go and ask them who they work for and go to a perp walk with somebody that owns a chicken farm or a agricultural uh, uh, or an orange grove in this state who hired them and send them to jail too. Send them home, send these guys to jail. Five years, seven years, and let them figure out who's gonna pick their oranges. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, no- oh, I can tell some people didn't like that. That's just too bad. No, pol no, po no politician is going to preside over the systematic roundup of millions of people from our streets putting them on buses or planes and sending them back, particularly with little babies and you know crying people and all this. Just ain't gonna happen. But I wanna go back to what Senator Simpson said, and I think he is absolutely right. The Congress failed on this. They had a program in place in 1986, but because they were afraid of uh, you know the mark of the beast people, uh, that the secure identifier was going to put the 666 on your head and usher in the Antichrist, they didn't do it. This is the key. This is what has to be done this time. You have to, we have to know who is here. Try not paying your income tax. The IRS will find you. Whatever they're doing, let's put it over to the Immigration and Naturalization Service. You know, it's like when I was in college. They kept screwing up my uh, records. I get the wrong grades and, uh, you know, they made a mistake and gave me an A once. They apologized. Uh, but they'd send it to the wrong address. The minute I finally graduated, within a week, I got a letter from the alumni office that had all of the correct information asking for money. Now, why can't we put the alumni office in charge of the records for the students who are in college? So I, that's what I want to do with, uh, with the IRS and the immigration. So we've got to have the secure identifier. We've got to know who's here. I agree with Bob. If, a, if an employer knowingly hires an illegal, and he or she would do that if the person could not present the secure identifier, then they ought to go to jail and have a huge fine on top of that. That would be an enormous disincentive, and I think we would cut the flow. We need a timeout. We need to assimilate who, are, who is here before we allow more to come in. You know, what, what, just so you all know this, Cal is on the terrorist watch list for airlines. Oh, yeah. Now, you don't want to travel with Cal because somehow or another, he's, I mean, I know he's not a terrorist. Sometimes he may sound like one, but he's not one. And, and you go to the airport with him and they say, Mr. Thomas, can you step out of the line here for a second? Yeah. He is on every, on six airlines, right? Three, three, three airlines. And growing, yeah. But, you know, I don't And so is the president of Guatemala and the, two yeah. or three other people. But there. Ted Kennedy used to be on two. At least he got off. But look, I don't have a group to complain to. I'm a tall white guy. Who am I going to complain to? And the last thing I would say about immigration is important. I, look, there is a lot more taking place now. You know, a lot of local law enforcement 
uh, officers and, and are beginning to do this job that the federal government should be doing. I give them credit for doing it. They ought to be getting the money to do it and not have to put it on you as taxpayers. The federal government, you know, again, if we didn't spend as much money on certain things as we do on others. But the, but the other the issue here is that in the last year of Bill Clinton's uh, term in office, there were 19,000 200 and some odd arrests of employers for illegally employing immigrants. Uh, illegal immigrants. You know how many there were in the last year of the Bush administration? Four. Four. Here's law and order for you. If we put the fence on the border, people are going to find a way to get around it, under it, over it, what have you. Why don't we lessen the restrictions to getting a visa at our consulates abroad and get those people who are running to the border to go to the consulates and try and come here legally. Because right now you have a whole bunch of poor people who would like to go to the consulate, but they don't have sufficient assets. They know they're going to get turned away. So they just go to the border, run, give the money to the uh, guide, the coyote guide, and they you know, take mm -hmm. their chances crossing the desert. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's an option. I'm, I, uh, I know there are problems with uh, counterfeit documents. Again. I really think, and I, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I, I think the Simpson plan from 86 is the correct one. It is the only one that will uh, guarantee the identity of the person who uh, is in question. But we've got to get over this hump of the, you know, the mark of the beast and all of this other business. Now, TSA, which I don't know if you saw 60 Minutes last night, is the most ridiculous thing. They got, they got a dozen guys named Robert Johnson together. Well, some are white, other different ethnic origins, African Americans, all named Robert Johnson. They're all on the terror list. Now they can't all be terrorists, and none of them is. But and then they had these idiotic explanations from these government officials. Now they tried this experimental program, which is supposed to be actually I think Orlando has it now in 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 some permanency called the um, uh, what? Oh, I thought you were making a you know, thing about it, incoming or something here. Uh, yeah, well, okay, but, but you get the fingerprint and the iris scan, right? This is great because that's the way to find out who you really are. So this experimental thing, I show up at National Airport, I put my eye in there, put my fingerprint on there, I'm, the, the, the okay deal comes up, I go right through. That's perfect. That's the kind of system we need for identifying people in this issue. And if we have that, I think our problem will be largely solved. If I, if I ever did that, it would sound like the Boston Pops of the 4th of July uh, when my closet was opened up. But the, uh, you know, you can't, there's something about, um, it's a fine line we've got to draw here between, uh, and one of the reasons I reluctantly came to Common Ground on the, on the IDs, because i am always been opposed to the idea of a national identification card. There's something about that. Now people say, well, you have social security cards, you have driver's licenses, all that. Uh, there's something about the government having that database uh, that bothers me. And by the way, it bothers a lot of conservatives. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, and the other point about, uh, you know, getting across the border, they'll find a way to do it. First, there's two things to keep in mind. Let's go back to our principal point. If the jobs were not here, they would not come. Secondly, you got to remember that a, a vast percentage of the gross national product uh, or the cash reserves of a lot of these of Latin American countries are dollars sent back from the United States there. And the other thing we've got to keep in mind, I understand you had the foreign minister's representative here today from Mexico, but let's be blunt about this. Vicente Fox and the Mexican government have uh, not done their share in keeping this uh, their deal here. Uh, I don't think that they mourn every time that another million uh, leave their country. And the other thing we better keep in mind is that somebody who was opposed to NAFTA back when we did it, and it's proven itself out. NAFTA was one of the greatest boondoggles for a bunch of rich corporate uh, entities, and it did cost people their jobs, it cost the environment, and it brought a lot more illegal immigrants here.